Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, very pleased to be here. Thanks to Dr. Ma and Darren for inviting me to come over. Um, decarbonization in Hong Kong. Um, the reason I choose this topic is that um, we just have a long-term decarbonization strategy public engagement activity. Anyone heard about this activity? Are you aware that something like this has been going on for the past few months? Uh, it has already, well, not concluded. The public engagement aspect is concluded. So it's now up to a research unit in Hong Kong University to summarize all the findings. And then it's up to the uh, Council for Sustainable Development to make a, rep uh, a recommendation to the Hong Kong government. One thing that I want to highlight about this public engagement is that uh, the practice of Council for Sustainable Development in Hong Kong has been one of a bottom-up approach, not top-down. Nobody like top-down, right? I, I tell you to do something, you'll probably say, okay, okay, but then as soon as you leave the classroom, you won't do that. And nobody like any top-down approach. But for this council, uh, for many years, it has been um, using this approach. So this public engagement is one of the bottom-up approach where uh, a lot of consultation groups and working groups and workshops and so on has been conducted. I think it's 60 or 80, I, I, don't, I, I don't remember. I was in some of those um, uh, workshops. So the purpose is to gather the um, sort of suggestions, queries, and from the general public and at the same time we hope to sort of uh, form a sort of a public based opinion where hopefully the opinion converge so that a, a policy will be formulated. Uh, there is some urge, uh, urgency about this exercise because next year 2020 we have to uh, make known to the world about how Hong Kong is going to uh, sort of uh, tackle this problem of decarbonization. So that's why I choose this topic. Um, my background, as I told Dr. Ma uh, during, during lunch today, is I, I am actually a science guy, you know, working in the Hong Kong Observatory. My main interest is weather forecasting, anything about meteorology, and maybe climate change. So justice and governance and energy is not my expertise, so you would probably know more than I do. But uh, I think these are connected, so I'll touch upon those issues uh, in, in my lecture uh, later on. So first of all, why do we need to decarbonize? So for us as an intelligent being, for us to commit ourselves to certain action, then we must understand why. Okay, so what is the rationale for decarbonization? Are there any scientific evidence suggesting that we should do that? Okay, so I'm going to spend maybe 10, 20 minutes about this aspect. So of course, it's about rising temperature. So this is not, um, I mean, a, a, a chart showing a long period of temperature rise for the whole world. This is for the whole world. Each bar is the temperature of one month, right? The monthly average temperature, not for Hong Kong, but for the whole world. So this is global temperature, right? And this zero line is making reference to this period. So we have a 30 year period, which is here. So we have a 30 year period, 1981 to 2010, and then we have a lot of temperature data here and there all, all over the world. We take the average. So each month we have one number, and that number is represented by one of the bars, right? So obviously, intuitively, we know that, okay, in the, in the early 1980s, then it's below the zero line, which, is, which means that the temperature is below the reference period. And then lately, we have uh, the, the, the monthly value above 
uh, the zero line. In particular, right, this year is particularly hot, which is 2016. 2016 is the hottest year uh, with the instrumental records. So we have about 150 years of instrumental records, right? So we are comparing here the last 12 months, take the average, compare with this, what we call the reference period. And then we are 0 0.55 degrees higher than this reference period. Right? So this is the scientific basis. Well, simply put, the world is warming up. And then it's not just warming up, it's also accelerating. So you, 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 you start to see that, the, well, we have a little bit of warming up here and there at the beginning of the 21st century, but then it's becoming hotter and hotter and hotter. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the hottest five years on that record are the latest five years. So that, that's something that uh, uh, should worry you, all right? But then some of you might question, 0 0.55 degrees Celsius, this is very small, right? Well, all of you sense temperature change, but I think nobody can sense a temperature change of 0 0.55 degrees. Right? Normally, if the temperature fluctuates by a few degrees, then we feel that either it's hot or warm or cool and so on and so on. So our sensory organ is only sensitive to the order of magnitude of a few degrees. So why do we worry about 0 0.55 degrees Celsius? Right? So I hope, um, okay, uh, another thing is about why temperature is rising. So this is a very famous curve called the Keeling's Curve. Keeling is name of a scientist working in NOAA, uh, USA. All right. He was the first person to establish a monitoring station at the mountain top in Hawaii, Mauna Loa. So why, do, why, why do they establish a, a station there? Because uh, that station, which is high up, more than 3,000 meters high up, uh, high up in the, uh, from the sea level, is free from pollution. So that the, the data which is recorded at that station is representative, right? It's free from noise, right? So this is the, just the, um, the past 50 years or 60 years of data. We see that carbon dioxide concentration uh, using the unit of parts per million of ppm. I know, I hope you know this unit, is that it is one of rising. And if you scrutinize this curve, you, you sort of feel that it's not just rising, it's accelerating. All right, so this is the latest one, up to, uh, up to September, uh, I mean, last, last month. So this is for the past 50, 60 years. Now, what is worrying is that if we trace back the carbon dioxide concentration for the past 800,000 years and show it in the graph here, we are in effect compressing the time scale. Right? The time scale here is only 60 years or 50 years, right? But the time scale here is 800,000 years. Now when I compress the time scale, I found that something extraordinary happened which is the rise in carbon dioxide in the past uh, uh, century is a straight line going, going straight upward, right? So this shows that something's wrong, right? Because for the past 800,000 years, there are of course ups and downs, ups and downs of carbon dioxide. It looks like the Earth has a certain mechanism to adjust the carbon dioxide level by its own, because a uh, human being set foot on the Earth somewhere around here. So before then, no human being, right? So it's natural, completely natural. So we can see from this graph here that Mother Nature seems to have a method, a tool, where it can adjust the carbon dioxide. When it is too low, then it will rise a little bit. When it is too high, it will fall. So it's sort of what we call the dynamic equilibrium. Nature, modern nature is in a dynamic equilibrium. But can you say that this dynamic, dynamic equilibrium is still there? Obviously no, we are off the chart, okay? So this is something that worries us. I used to say that if there is some intelligent being out, outside the solar system watching Earth, and then they measure using the spectroscopy and so on and so on and found the carbon dioxide is increasing in that manner. 
and that inter extraterrestrial intelligent being will conclude something is wrong with the Earth, right? People outside knows that something is wrong, but we, I mean, in the Chinese saying, uh, we are living on the Earth, we don't feel that something is wrong, so that's the problem. Okay, so that is the reason why we have temperature rise. Now, um, let me go back to the, um, the, a little bit of science. Um, there are still quite a lot of people who doesn't believe in climate change. Uh, notably, Donald Trump, right? And uh, a number of uh, the Republican members of the USA. Uh, there are some climate deniers also in Hong Kong as well but they are not making a, as loud a noise as Donald Trump and those people in the United States. So, we have to ask ourselves whether we can believe in the science, all right? We have the temperature data, we have the carbon dioxide data, but is that a true story? In particular, about the projection in the future, are the scientists good enough to tell us what is going to happen 20 years from now, 50 years from now? We have to be skeptical about what the scientist tells, tells us. But skepticism is different from denial. So there are people who deny climate change altogether. But as students, as even teachers, lecturers, professors, we should have a skeptical mind. So the point is that this is something what we call Conciliance, conciliation of uh, evidence. We have decrease in glacier, decrease in snow cover, the tree line shifting towards the pole or towards uh, upward in the mountains. We have spring coming earlier, we have species migrating poleward and so on, and uh, we have the, uh, uh, sort of a reduction in sea ice coverage and so on. Now, each of this is actually a different scientific, uh, scientific discipline. So scientists working with the glaciers know nothing about spring coming earlier, right? Which, which is basically biology, right? Biodiversity and so on. But all these different scientific disciplines, after studying for a long, long time, gathering a lot of data, they will come to the same conclusion. And that same conclusion is that all these things which are happening can be um, can be sort of regarded as a result of rising temperature. So this is what we call consilience of evidence. Right? So different scientific disciplines coming to the same conclusion. So that's one thing that why science is convinced or sort of, sort of um, given us the best available advice. And the other thing about science is of course that science although it's not always 100% correct. You can ask the director of the Hong Kong Observatory, can you tell me what exactly is the temperature tomorrow morning? <laughs> it can't tell you. Probably, well, around 26 degrees, something like that. It can't tell you whether it's 26.1 or 25.9. No one, no scientist is 100% about what they say. Even they have spent decades doing the same research. So science has always has some uncertainty. Or even for the case of climate science, uh, it's basically impossible to tell you what is going to happen 10 years from now with confidence, with absolute confidence, right? So science is uncertain. But at the present moment, science gives you the best sort of uh, advice or the best piece of information from which based on which you can make your, your decision. So this is a side story. Uh, we talk about a melting glacier. So there is a glacier, uh, a funeral for a dead glacier, which is just held uh, a couple of months ago. I think it was in August in Iceland. So uh, a number of people gather around the dead glacier mourning the loss of the glacier. So that was the glacier called the Ok. Ok is pronounced as Ok in Iceland, Iceland language. So this Ock glacier was pretty large one time uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, it's actually larger than the entire Kowloon Peninsula. But now, what is left is this. Uh, 
right? So you can appreciate how uh, the glaciers are shrinking. So this is just one example that points to the fact that the world is warming. Now let's go back to my question. Why do we worry about 0 0.5 degrees Celsius? Well, that's from 1980, all right, 0 0.5. If we go back 100 years, there is a larger rise in temperature, which is about 1.2 degrees Celsius for the past century or so, right? But even 1.2 degrees Celsius, the 1 degree Celsius, roughly speaking, why do we care about 1 degree change in temperature, whereas every day, you experience several degrees of change in temperature. For example, in Hong Kong, it can be as hot as 36.6 degrees, right? Sometime in 2017, so very hot, 36.6 degrees. But many, many years ago, Hong Kong's absolute minimum temperature was zero. You know that? Zero. So the temperature recorded at the Hong Kong Observatory at Tim Tao Chui was at one time zero degree. So the range of fluctuation of temperature is 36.6 degrees. So that is something we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. But why do we worry of one degree Celsius change? Okay? So this graph tells you the, 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 the reason behind. Now, this is what we call the temperature distribution. So we have a lot of data in this 30-year period, 1951 to 1980 lots of data, right? So we draw a distribution, and this is somewhat a normal distribution. Most of the temperature uh, cluster around the average, the zero is the average. So we have some cold temperature, some hot temperature, and so on, right? So that was the reference, uh, and the reference is taken from data from 1951 to 1980. Now, let's advance the time a little bit to 1983 to 1993, right? Then we found that the new period, which is a 10-year period, or 11-year period, is shifted towards the warm side. So this is warm temperature. So the entire distribution shifted towards the warm side, right? This is expected because the world is warming up. But what is significant about this shift of the distribution is the emergence of a new category of temperature represented by this color. This is extremely hot. All right? In the old days, well, we still have some cases of extremely hot weather, but so few, so little, that it cannot be represented in this graph. But now it is very obvious that we have a number of cases of extremely hot weather. Okay? So you, if you look at the shift of temperature, it's just by a little bit, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, right? But we have a new category of extremely hot weather. Now, let's advance the, the time even closer to the, to the present, 2005 to 2015. Then this is a new distribution. And you have a significant portion of the whole distribution which is categorized under the extremely hot category, which is, of course, heat wave. We have significantly more heat wave. I right, put it in a con quantitative po uh, a context. In the old days, it only covers 0.1%. Now, 14.5%. So, what does it mean? the probability of heat wave occurring increased by 145 fold, 145 times. All right, so the significance is not the shift of the average temperature by one degree, it is the increase of very hot weather. And of course, hot weather kills, right? Because we have one, one, one incident 16 years ago, 2003. Um, you were just born. Uh, so you have no idea what 2003 was. In Hong Kong, it's a very, very bad year because we had SARS, right? We have SARS killing 300 people, I think. But in Europe, it's even worse because 70,000 people were killed in Europe because of a heat wave. 
So that sounds unbelievable, right? Right? Europe is supposed to be one of the best technologically advanced region or, or, or continent in the world. How come 70,000 people were killed in one single heat wave? And that, that really happened. So heat wave is not something trivial. It is important. And that was a general concept. Now we have another heat wave in Europe. Uh, luckily, because of the 2003 heat wave, which killed in, in France alone, hit, killed 30,000 people in France alone. The countries in Europe are pre prepared. So once again, France is hardly hard hit by this heat wave, and the casualty is only very, very uh, few. So only a few people were killed in this heat wave. It's so hot that part of the France registered temperature 10 degrees above normal. So this is very hot, 10 degrees above normal, right? So this is um, uh, the latest heat wave. Um, but then some people ask, um, okay, a heat wave occurred in Europe, but are you sure this is related to climate change or global warming? No, we can never be sure. We can never be sure. But right now, we have a new branch of science called attribution science, which is actually, well, Theoretically, very simple. We run computer models in two different scenarios. One scenario is that we ask the computer to do simulation and with the assumption that there is no carbon dioxide emission. There is no human being on this earth. So everything is natural, right? Because of the sun, because of the volcanic eruption and things like that, right? And then I asked the computer to do another simulation, simulation, this time with the presence of human beings, with the, with the fact that the carbon dioxide is spewing out from the factories and so on and so on, day after day. And then we compare the two results. And we can draw a conclusion, the scientists can draw a conclusion that this kind of heat wave has a probability of, I mean, 500%, uh, increase in 500% of five times. Right? So what it means is that this kind of heat wave do occur in the past, it will occur in the future, but the chances of this kind of heat wave occurring will be multiplied by five because of climate change. So uh, this, are, this is just an extract from The Guardian. This is just half a month in September this year, so a lot of uh, extreme weather. So heat wave is, a, is of course an extreme weather. We have all the extreme weather. So this is all about typhoons, uh, wildfire because of drought, because of high temperature. We have flooding because global warming. Uh, one characteristic of global warming is that it will increase the severity of flood and heavy rainfall. So this is just for half a uh, month, and then you have a lot of uh, severe weather. They are not, not every one of them is attributable to climate change but most of them are. All right, uh, let's go to Hong Kong, right? Closer to Kong. So, um, well, we are living in a sort of controlled environment most of the time. We don't really feel the blunt of the heat wave. We don't feel the risk or danger of extreme weather. Just like last year, we have a very bad typhoon, right? No one was killed because we have a very good infrastructure. So everyone has the, maybe the wrong concept that we are living in a lucky place, we're living in a lucky place where we are immune from extreme weather. This is our misunderstanding of that procedure because we have a very good infrastructure which protects us from extreme weather. But actually, the impact of climate change can impact, uh, yeah, affect us directly or indirectly. So this is one of the direct threats to Hong Kong. Mosquitoes. I think mean, you're all very lucky. Uh, probably no one has contracted dengue fever let alone malaria, but I was very unlucky. 
because I contracted malaria two times, twice, when I was uh, in Form 1 and then in Form 2 because malaria was prevalent at that time. Now, with global warming and climate change, we expect rise in temperature, we expect more rainfall as a result of the atmosphere's ability to hold more moisture. Let's talk, a look at, at, uh, let's talk about temperature first. Now, in order for a mosquito to be infectious, okay, it has to bite, first of all. So this is the uh, physiology of the mosquito. They tend to bite more with higher temperature. The higher the temperature, the female mosquito tends to bite more. So this is one form. And then the other form, which is very or equally or more important, is that in order for the mosquito to be infectious, the pathogen inside the body of the mosquito has to be mature. So there is an incubation period within the mosquito. And that incubation period decrease sharply with rising temperature, right? If the temperature is about 15 degrees, then it takes 50, 50 days for the pathogen to be mature. If the temperature is 35, then it takes just a few days. So the mosquitoes as a species in general will be much, much more infectious than if the temperature is cool. So global warming is fastening this kind of process, uh, shortening the incubation period. So as a result, this and that together, we have an exponential rise in the possibility of the transmission. Uh, but of course, we can deal with that. The government can deal with that by I mean, spraying insecticide here and there, right? But, well, it has side effect. Tell you, it, it has side effect because a lot of insects, which are good insects, which are positive, that contribute positive to, to the biosphere and other things are killed in the, at the same time. So there are side, side effects. This is just uh, two months ago, less than two months ago, uh, air pollution uh, sort of uh, data from the EPA, uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Well, let's, let's focus on here. This is ozone. This is the small hours in the morning. So this is midnight, one o'clock in the uh, one, o one o'clock at night, and so forth and so on. You can see that there's basically no ozone during the small hours of the morning. But then during the particular day, the ozone soar to 390. I don't know. I forget the WHO recommendation. At least 10 times. I think it's about 10 times above the limit. And the WHO uh, recommendation is that the allowable exceedance of high ozone in our air is zero. So the ideal situation is that we should not have any, not a single day where the ozone barrier is so high, because ozone is very bad to our health, uh, to our respiratory system, if you have uh, asthma or other heart disease, respiratory disease, then you will be heart hit as a result of high concentration of ozone. And the result, uh, the reason for this drastic increase in ozone is of course a process called photochemical reaction. We have some pollutants in the air, for example the NOx, the SOx, and some VOC, volatile organic compound, which is emitted naturally by the trees, but sometimes by artificial means, by human means. So when the NOx and SOx, the pollutants, react with the VOC under strong sunlight and under high temperature, then you will have exponential increase in the ozone uh, concentration. So we are talking about global warming. Higher temperature is favorable for more ozone to be formed. Um, I just a few, few weeks ago, I talked to Professor Alexis Lowe of Hong Kong US, and they told me that the ozone situation this year is particularly bad. I, I, I don't have the detailed information, but that's what he told me. So this is some, something we have to be concerned as a result of global warming. And then, Mangut, last year, Sanjok, right? 
Well, we all experience the, well, the, 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 the severity of the storm. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to tell you because the social media are full of videos and, and, and images and so on. So we all know the impact of Mangut. Now let's put it in perspective of climate change. One important thing about uh, Typhoon is that Oh, it's not, it's not written in, oh, I, I didn't include that slide. If you go to the Hong Kong Observatory website, there is a map showing the places which were flooded during the onslaught of Piper Mangrove. Practically, all places along the shoreline of Hong Kong were flooded. Of course, Han Fa Chun, Mei Yi were hard escaped. And you have Sahati, Daibo Shati, and Daibo also have a seat, right? Something that I've never seen before in my life complete Shati River flooding. And this is something that I've ne never seen. Uh, I, I haven't seen since the, uh, uh, the, the, the new town was built. And the reason is, of course, something called storm surge, right? The typhoons, because of the very strong winds, can push the water towards the shore causing flooding. But that situation was worsened, exacerbated by the rise in sea level. For instance, this is the amount of sea level rise projected by the end of this century. It may not be 100% correct, but chances are, because of the acceleration of global warming, that by the end of the century it will exceed one meter. More than that, this is sort of a sort of assessment made several years ago, maybe five or six years ago, after the AR5, the assessment report number five of the IPCC, which is the authoritative publication produced by the United Nations. So that was the assessment made to five or six years ago. It's most likely that when a new assessment come out, it will be more than that value. Now let's stick to this one. Mangut caused a 3.8 meter rise in sea level. Then we can compare this rise, 3.8 is pretty high, right? Probably higher than the, than the ceiling of, the, of this room. We can compare this value with the past data of Hong Kong because the Hong Kong Observatory has been operating for more than 100 years. So we have a lot of information data about sea level rise as a result of Python approach, right? So we can calculate the possibility of, for example, a rise in 3.5 meters above the sea mean sea level is a 50 year event, meaning that it will occur on the average once every 50 years. That is according to past so statistics. Now, if the sea level were to rise by one meter by the end of the century, then a rise of 3.8 meter, which is equivalent to that to that assumption, Sancho or Mangut, will be a one year event. All right? So something that should happen on, regular, on a basis of 50 or 60 years will happen every year in the future if a typhoon were to strike Hong Kong. So that is the significance of global warming. Why do we have sea level, sea level rise? Because of course, the sea has a lot of water. And then they expand under global warming. Higher temperature, larger volume, expansion, right? And the other is of course, we just mentioned, melting of the glacier. So it causes the sea level rise. And then another factor is that if you compare the uh, 2017 team gap, a severe typhoon, and Mangut, which is last year. If you have some basic understanding about satellite imagery and the weather and meteorology, your intuition, your feeling is that Hato, Tinga, seems to be stronger than Mangut. Right? Because the eye, uh, particularly in the radar, this is satellite, this is radar. The, the eye is very compact, it's very symmetrical. Whenever we see this kind of signature, 
we know that this is a strong typhoon. Whereas for the case of Mengut, well, we can sort of discern the eye, but it's not so compact, it's not so symmetrical. So the first assessment, making use of this kind of imagery, is that Hector is even stronger in terms of wind speed than Mengut. But we all know that the impact of Mangut is much, much stronger than Hatu, right? 60,000 trees were destroyed as a result of Mangut. Nothing like that in Hatu. Why? As a, matter of, as, as a matter of fact, when you come close to Hong Kong, the central, what we call the maximum wind speed, which is used to determine the category of a typhoon, you know, we have tropical depression, which is pretty weak, and then tropical storm, and then typhoon, super severe typhoon, and super typhoon. So both of them were super typhoon one at one stage at the time. So that was based on what we call the maximum sustained wind speed, which is the wind measure within the eye wall. The eye wall is somewhere here. So this is the, the place where you have the strongest wind. So when we measure the wind speed, and then we compare the with the other wind speed, <coughs> And then reach a certain criteria, oh, we will say that this is a super typhoon, this is just a typhoon, so on so on. So this one is stronger than that one, but that one caused a lot more damage. So why is that? Naturally, you can tell from this image. You can give me the answer from, from these two images. It's because of the size, right? The center of the storm is not as strong as this one, but the size is much larger than this one. So obviously, if you have a larger storm with strong winds blowing around, the damage will obviously be larger, right? So uh, in the old days, uh, we judge a typhoon, a typhoon simply from the maximum wind speed near the center. But now, if you talk about destruction of a typhoon, you have to consider the area. So this is what we call, this is what we call tropical cyclone destructive potential. You have to integrate the wind speed, which is the maximum wind speed near the center, and also the area over a period of time, right? The longer the time the typhoon attack you, then the damage will be larger, and so on and so on. So the result is that we have a potential, and if the temperature rises by two degrees, western North Pacific, Pacific which is our region, the destructive potential will rise significantly, right? From less than 50 to more to about 20. So that is the situation for our area, Western North Pacific. This is for Atlantic, for, for, for USA, for Canada, and so on. Right? So again, a, a rise, but not as strong as uh, the case in, in our area. Drought. Uh, we just talked over lunch that uh, water security is a very important issue because Hong Kong is having a large population. And again, you're all very lucky. You haven't experienced any bad drought in your 20 years, maybe less, a little bit less than 20 years. But I was unfortunate to have experienced the worst drought in history of Hong Kong, which is 1963. Very bad, very bad drought. It is so bad that everyone is just depressed. Because at that time, I was only a small, I was only a small boy. But I can feel the depression of the entire city. Because every day, you look out your window and hope that rain will come. But sadly and depressingly, the rain didn't come. And if that happens day after day, day after day, you become very depressed because life hinges upon the rainfall. And as a matter of fact, in 2014, when I visited uh, Australia to do a documentary about drought in Australia, in Queensland, and I know from interviews uh, a lot of farmers that some farmers did kill themselves, commit suicide, as a result of an 18-month drought in Queensland. So drought can kill directly as a result of lack of water resource. It can also kill because of psychological reason, because of depression. So last year, if you notice or uh, pay attention to the weather conditions in Hong Kong, we have first five months, which is very, very dry. And uh, this is an agricultural lake in northern part of Lao Sayutang. 
This is a, a reservoir, right? It's completely dry, it's bone dry. But that is, that is May, that is May. May is supposed to be a month with a lot of rainfall, but it is bone dry. So some of the journalists are sensitive about that and ask the question, hey, is this going to be a drought in Hong Kong? So I answer them and say that, okay, this is just the beginning of the rain season, so don't worry about that at the present moment. Luckily, we have a lot of rainfall, uh, particularly and good also from the bottom of the But the risk is there, right? This is what we call the rainfall index. Uh, I talked about the very bad drought in Hong Kong, 1963. If the index is less than minus two, it is extremely, extremely dry. So minus two is already a bad drought. In 1963, is minus three point something. So very bad. So you can see that Hong Kong is not immune to drought. We do have drought in the past. Now we have Dongjiang River. So we don't worry about water security. But is that the right attitude? Let's take a look at the science. You. I don't know whether you've been to that. This is a, a sort of tourist. Uh, I mean, there are some local tour bringing you to Hong Kong, which is just next to Dongjiang. And then you have a very large uh, reservoir there called the uh, Samtong Gong, Sing Dongjiang Reservoir. Very large, so you can see from the area which is comparable to probably larger than Kowloon Peninsula and so on. So a very large reservoir. So it's this Dongjiang, which uh, give us the water and then is transported all the way to Dongguan and then there are pipes uh, bringing the water to Hong Kong. Now the idea of this map is that when Hong Kong has a bad drought in 1963, there is also a bad drought in Hawaii, although not as bad as Hong Kong. When Hong Kong has a lot of rainfall, Hawaii also has a lot of rainfall. When Hong Kong is dry, when Hawaii was dry, Hong Kong is also dry. Well, this is not that is actually to be expected, right? Because all you is so close to Hong Kong. And in fact, the whole Dongjiang River is so close to Hong Kong. Most of the time, they are under the influence of the same weather system. So there is no reason why Hong Kong is dry and then we have a lot of rainfall in all you know, and, and Dongjiang. This is not uh, I mean, logical, right? So the problem is that if Hong Kong experiences a bad drought in the future, it is very likely that Hong Jiang River also experienced a bad drought. That uh, we give uh, ask the question of what is security in Hong Kong. And then something which is not seems to be not very direct. Biodiversity, laws of biodiversity. Uh, this is a very new report published just a few months ago. It's about the laws of biodiversity for the whole world. And this report highlighted that there is a chance of one million species becoming extinct, becoming extinct. So that is another mass extinction, right? We have a few mass extinction in the past, and there is a mass extinction on the making. And this is the projection in terms of uh, temperature rise. Uh, this is judging from Temperature alone, judging from weather alone. We have other factors that contribute to loss of species. For example, pollution is of course a very important factor. For example, over catching, over killing, right, is of course another important factor. But this one deals with weather, right? So when the temperature rises by three or four percent, then you have something like 10% of the species dying as a result of climate change. So I have to emphasize at this point that climate change is not the cause of all evils. We are under the challenge of different kinds of threats, right? But climate change has an important characteristic that it will multiply, multiply the challenges that we are facing. All right. So there are other, other reasons contributing to loss of species, but climate change will add to that problem. 
So this is a report published last year. Uh, if the temperature rises by two degrees Celsius, uh, judging from the, the, the what we call the uh, in pre-industrial era, then the, most of the coral reef, in fact more than 99% of the coral reef will die. So we lost one species, which is a coral reef. Well, actually there are a lot of species of coral reef. And then as far as, as, far as fish is concerned, which is directly affecting us because we really Hong Kong people like to eat a lot of fish, right? So 3 million tons of uh, catch will be lost. So what is 3 million tons? We don't probably have the idea of what does it mean by 3 million tons of fish? Well, you can actually convert it to annual consumption of fish in Hong Kong. 3 million tons is equivalent to 6 years of consumption of fish in Hong Kong. But Hong Kong people eat a lot of fish. If we Hong Kong people, if we eat the same amount of fish as the average globally, then 3 million tons is good enough for us for 20 years. So it's 20 years worth of supply of fish for Hong Kong population. So that's a lot, that's a lot, right? And then with agricultural uh, uh, productivity, which is suffering losses from, from 12%, 7%. Well, you might have thought that 7% is not a large number. But no, but no. We are very concerned about food security. Because in addition to this loss of agricultural productivity as a result of climate change, we have population explosion. We have more mouths to feed, right? So how can we deal with food security when we have more and more people and yet less and less food? Less and less fish, less and less agricultural productivity. So that's going to be a major challenge in the next few decades. Unless we've come up with something creative, everybody will suffer from hunger, I can assure you. And then health and so on and so on. And this is the uh, insects, so some of the insects will be gone uh, as a result of uh, rising temperature by two degrees Celsius. I know that many of you don't like in insects, right? It's uh, sort of scary. But insects are very important. It's the most, well, not most, it's one of the linchpin of the biological biological surfaces that provide you the human being. Take for instance, bees, butterflies. If there's no bees, there are no butterflies, there will be no crops, right? Well, not no, but a lot of crops cannot grow because we need pollination by the bees and by the insects. So if they were gone, then a lot of crops cannot be grown. And uh, even the vertebrates, well, which is supposed to be the higher uh, 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 order of the animals will survive. So we have a threat, of, 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 of a food security threat. And this is a projection. This is not about the present. Okay? So it tells us that uh, the percentage change in yields between present and 2015. So this is a projection up to 2015, middle of the century. So if it is belonging to this color, you have negative change, meaning that those, those parts of the world will suffer from decreasing of the country. So it's clear from this map here that most parts of the world will suffer from a decrease in agricultural productivity. Something that seems to be very remote from us climate refugee, uh, Syria over there. Millions of people are displaced, and you just heard the news, watch the news that there is a war fighting between Turkey and Syria, right? So it's one of the most unsettled places in the world. But in the past 10 years or so, there is an outward flux of refugee from Syria. Many of them are political, social, financially driven. But those factors are once again magnified, multiplied by adverse weather. Because 
Syria suffered a five-year drought in a row, right? So that some of the people who used to be self-sufficient in terms of growing their own food cannot grow the food any longer. So they rush to the city, Damascus, and look for opportunities. But of course, because of poor, poor governance and so forth and so on, there's uh, no way out. So they have to sort of move to other parts of the world, causing chaos to Turkey and also to Europe. Now it also spawned terrorism. And this is a picture in USA. Many, many years ago, 1930s. So people are queuing up for what? For free coffee and donuts. So someone is doing a philanthropy, something like that. Some, 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 some good thing, right? So all the free drink and food for the people who are jobless. Do you know who offer this drink and food to these poor people? It's not the government. There's a mafia, you know, the gangsters in USA. They offer free drink and food to the people. Why? Because they want to gain the heart of the people so that when the police come to invest, to, to do criminal investigation, these people, because they see the mafia as the savior, will try to shelter, I mean, to block the police from doing all kinds of investigations. So that is a strategy used by the mafia in the 1930s. And then more is the same strategy was used by ISIS in Iraq, in, in, in unsettled places in the Middle East, because they are suffering from all kinds of hardship, and with, of, of which climate change is one of the factors, not the sole factor, but one of the factors. And then the ISIS saw the weakness of those people, and they offer them money, they offer them food, shelter, and so on and so on, asking them to do terrorism acts and so on. So that is that explains the rise of ISIS. As a matter of fact, more than 10 years ago, a think tank in the US, uh, mainly composed of retired generals of the US military, issued a report specifically identifying climate change as a cause of national security and terrorism. And that was published more than 10 years ago. And the history is repeating itself. So let's go to Hong Kong once again. It's also a justice problem. This is a summary of the results of the research by some scientists uh, in the Chinese CUHK. And it pointed out that in buildings, close in, 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 in the developed buildings, in sorry, I mean, in very urbanized places where you have a lot of buildings packed together, right? So you have what we call the high, uh, like an urban uh, heat island index. So places with uh, high urban heat island index, like uh, some sort of Bao, maybe somewhere across Hong Kong, because Okay, so if the temperature of a certain day is higher than one degree Celsius, the average temperature, then 4.1% of, there will be 4.1% of mortality. People die for various reasons, for bad health and so on and so on. If the temperature is higher than 29 degrees, then one degree further increase in temperature will cause 4.1 more percent more of people dying. Right? This is for the populated or the high UHI areas as a whole, disregarding the social economic based status. But if we stratify the status according to the social economic in the income and so forth and so on, then the percentage will rise to 5.6. So more people who are poor who are living under the poverty line, who do not have a good living environment, will die more as a result of high temperature. So this is the kind of living conditions that uh, some of us uh, are still, uh, still uh, living in. So this is injustice. Well, this is only uh, part of the iceberg. 
And then we have injustice in the global scale. This is an index called the Climate Vulnerability Index. The blue color represents not so vulnerable, right? Uh, considering climate change in the future. So climate is going to change for many years to come. And then this is a computer simulation of which part of the world will not suffer as a result of climate change. And this one is that the lower the value, uh, or the darker the color, it represents that those people will suffer more as a result of climate change. So you can see that South America, Central America, Africa, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Asia, those people who are the poorest, who are now the most vulnerable, will become even more vulnerable in the future. So that's injustice in a global scale. Right? We are talking about billions of people under this kind of future condition. So that brings to the problem of the issue of the ethical dimension of climate change. There are a lot of people who deny climate change. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who know that climate change is happening, but choose to do nothing. Ethically, is that right? So we come to that idea. Well, uh, people ask, well, just like George W. Bush and Donald Trump, right? They say that, um, hey, well, the science is not certain. Um, we don't need to do anything until the science is 100% certain. That is asking an impos impossible question because there is always uncertainty associated with science. Science cannot be 100% certain. Right? So if you act until you have all the facts in hand, that is a recipe for inaction. It means that you're not going to do anything about climate change forever. Because that stage where you have all the facts in hand never comes, never occurs. Right? So we are, as human beings, young person like you or old person like me, we have to make decisions all the time. We always make decisions under uncertainty. You don't have a crystal ball. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. What is the economy of Hong Kong 10 years from now? What is the profession that has, has to choose to give me a, a better life in the future and so on? You, you don't know that, right? We always make decisions under uncertainty. Now, if we make decisions under uncertainty, if the consequence is important or great, then it's always good to take precaution. And that is a guiding principle for policy formulation, precautionary principle. If something that is potentially harmful, like climate change, like global warming, then it is better for us to take action despite we don't know exactly that climate change is going to be that worse in the future, right? So, my ball here and there, that, that is the right policy. So, expanding on this precautionary principle, then a Gavi, which is someone, some expert who deal with the ethics of climate change, you say that if someone says that science is uncertain, so we wait and see, then it is equivalent to gambling with the life of people. If someone says that the cause of medication is too high, we shouldn't do anything, then again, it is vicious. If uh, we should wait for a technological fix, because oh, after all, human beings are very intelligent, we can create technology, we can solve all the problems. But before that technology is operational, is available, we cannot depend on it. So if we have this kind of thought, it's reckless. So all this put together justify aggressive so someone say that the uh, climate change is like a perfect moral storm. You know, a mor uh, perfect storm is a bulk, uh, telling the story of a guy who sailed across the Atlantic or Pacific, I don't know where, and they, he experienced waves up to more than 100 feet of height. Gigantic waves. And that didn't occur most of the time. It's rare, only on rare occasions that this kind of wave occurs. It is the coincidence of a number of 
factors. For example, I have a storm here, a storm there, and a storm there. And the storms send out waves in all directions, and then when they meet, they will have constructive interference. So the wave will step one upon the another, creating a gigantic wave. So this is a perfect storm. But for climate change, it's a perfect moral storm. Because of three reasons. One is that the least responsible are likely to suffer the most, like what I discussed, right? In Hong Kong, the poorest people will suffer the most, will die, more of them will die, and also the same for the, for the whole world. The victims cannot hold us accountable. You and I are responsible for climate change because every, every, every piece of clothes that we buy, every meal that we consume, every uh, trip that we take uh, to other countries, more carbon dioxide generation, and it will cause the uh, climate change to become worse. So we are all accountable, but some of them cannot hold us accountable because some of them are very poor. Poor people do not have a voice, um, are, not, are not vocal. Some of them are not yet born. We are talking about the next generation and the generation of the next. How can they accuse we in the current generation of doing something? bad or not doing anything while we have the ability to do so. And then some of them are non-human. Right? You, you talk to the species. You have different species who are facing the threats of extinction. They cannot make a vote. And then most importantly, the current institution is not capable of dealing with a problem or challenge like climate change, which is multifaceted which is cross-disciplinary, right? So it is, we don't have an institution to do that. So this is a perfect moral song. So I have to rush, I don't think I have a lot of time, right? So I'm going to rush a little bit. So talking about the last point, is about governance. Climate change is a, a problem which is very difficult to deal with because it needs um, what? Well, collaboration. But we you know that this world, particularly in the international arena, we have a deep schism between one country and the other country. We are competing against one another. For example, China and US. They are under conflict because of the trade war. Right? They want to gain economically. So. They are enemies. They have a wide schism between them. How can you expect China and US to cooperate in solving climate change, right? And also climate change is very special in the sense that it is public goods. What is public goods? Probably Dr. Ma will tell you in the election. There is something that if I enjoy good climate, then I am not depriving the opportunity of other people in the world to enjoy the same good climate. So this is public goods. So for public goods, because it is a problem of all people in the world, so I have the tendency of doing nothing and enjoy enjoying the fruits of the hard work of other people. Because there's no boundary about climate change. Right? So that makes the problem very difficult. But nevertheless, we have success before, like the Montreal Protocol dealing with ozone problem, like the whaling, right? Forbidding countries to kill the whales. Unfortunately, Japan has pulled out from that at, uh, the international agreement. We have air pollution or transboundary, cross-boundary air pollution. So, and so these are basically dealt with successfully in the international community. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, climate change is a hundred times more complicated. Right? For, for the case of Montreal Protocol dealing with ozone depleting chemicals, as long as we, we can find a replacement, then all the problems are solved. Right? But in climate change, we are dealing with a change of our civilization. Our civilization is based on fossil fuel for more than 200 years. We enjoy the benefits of using fossil fuels. 
But at the same time, we now notice that, we now realize that we have to pay our bill because we damage our environment, we damage the climate system, right? So this is changing the civilization altogether. So this is much, much difficult. But all the same, we have to do something right, about that. So we start more than a, a quarter of a century ago called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and uh, which is a framework convention, a high uh, uh, sort of a, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of a, a theoretical or the framework. And then we come to something more practical with the Kyoto Protocol. Right? So this is a protocol which tells which country to do what how much carbon dioxide you should reduce. But unfortunately, this is a this is a failure. And we all know that George W. Bush, the younger Bush, pulled out, pulled US out from the Kyoto Protocol. Exactly the same, 16 years later, Donald Trump pulled out from Paris Agreement. Right? So this is something political. It becomes, I mean, uh, it's very difficult for, for the whole world to, to act in concert. And then we have the Copenhagen uh, Climate Summit, which is uh, people expect a lot from that climate summit because we are going to uh, come up with a new uh, uh, sort of international agreement to replace the Kyoto Protocol. We hope that something is going to be good coming out because of various reasons, because of time constraints. I cannot go on uh, uh, in details. In particular, there's a thing called Climate Gate. There is a plot to discredit, discredit the entire science, uh, climate science. And the plot was successful. Uh, you can search for climate data and we'll know what it's about. It's about an email server in one university in UK was hacked. And then some of the emails were taken out and then exposed to the public out of context. And then they employ some people who are good in their writing. They bought it, they buy those, uh, those people called co-app rock writers and discredit the climate scientists, right? So the entire global climate summit or negotiation is based on the foundation of good science. Now, if the science itself is discredited, is not deliverable, how can we go on to carry out the discussion? So this is a complete failure. But, but one thing that comes out good from the Copenhagen uh, uh, summit is that uh, it come to realize that because of the big schism that I talked about between different countries like US and China, it's better to use a bottom-up approach. And that is exactly the approach used in the 2015 uh, Paris uh, uh, summit. So I briefly go through that. This is because of a lot of people have goodwill, including President Xi Obama. They strike the deal before, before the Paris talk. This is in 2014. The Paris Agreement is 2015. And then President Xi strike a deal with French President, with uh, uh, with the Prime Minister of India, and so on and so on. All right. So a lot of goodwill uh, took place in 2014. And then of course we have the Pope who issued an encyclical, urging uh, all Christians, all Catholics in the world to uh, conserve, to concern about climate change. So uh, a very good atmosphere was uh, sort of uh, uh, created, which is favorable and conducive for a uh, fruitful Paris Agreement. So that was the first agreement, I'm not going into detail. But just to give you an idea that the Paris Agreement is just, just a stopping point, because the science, the scientist tells us, we should restrict the temperature to here. For the Paris Agreement, it is two degrees, all right? But we should expand all efforts to limit the rise of temperature to 1.5. We're now here. So you know that if we want to sort of meet the aspiration of the Paris Agreement, we have a very small margin. Now let's go back to the Paris Agreement. One important approach is the bottom-up approach, which means that each country who signed the Paris Agreement will need to have something called the, um, what, the, uh, what? 
the uh, intended nationally determined contribution. So, for example, US or China, they judge for themselves how much they can contribute to climate action. How much carbon dioxide reduction in what emission uh, can they achieve? And then no one, no one forces you to do anything, all right? So they make a pledge, I'm going to reduce by that amount. Now, based on that amount, then uh, it is quite likely that the temperature will rise to here, 2.9. So we want our temperature to be here, but uh, to be here, but instead, according to the pledges of the countries, it should be here. And according to policies, because a country make a pledge, and then the policy may not align with the pledge. All right, based on the policy, then the temperature would rise probably to 3.2. So this is not optimistic at all, all right? Paris Agreement as an initial pledge will take us from here to there. This is disastrous. So that's why next year is going to be very important because all countries will be revising their NDC or intended NDC. Because every five years, there is a mechanism where the countries will uh, uh, revise, uh, taking, taking into consideration the current situation and all the technological advances and so on. So um, it takes maybe, oh, this is shifted somewhat. About most of the uh, pessimistically, it takes about 10 years for us to reach 1.5 degrees. Right? Or maybe 20 years, because science is uncertain. So we have only very limited time ahead of us. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that one. Okay, um, this slide is about the cause of climate action. Um, Donald Trump withdrew from Paris Agreement because he said that it would cost the US $3 trillion by 2040. And then it will lose uh, 2.7 million jobs, so far gone. And of course, uh, there is an agenda uh, for Donald Trump. Uh, because before he became president, he pledged to pull off on the Paris Agreement, disregard of the scientific evidence of what's on. So that kind of data, which, is seen, which seems very alarming, which seems very uh, hurtful to the in country, is actually based on a biased report published by a think tank called NERA, N-E-R-A, in search for what NERA is. That think tank, was actually funded by the fossil fuel industries. All right, so that think tank come up with a report based on wrong assumptions. And one of the worst thing about that report is that it didn't take care into consideration something we call externality. What is externality? Externality is that if I use coal for power generation, then it produces air pollution, right? Air pollution hurts not just our health, but also our economy, because the government needs to build more hospitals, more people are sick, they have to be hospitalized, and so on and so on. So this can be translated into economic laws. That report didn't take care of the externality at all. So this is not a fair or, or a good reference. But instead, uh, a report published by a group of scientists in Stanford last year say that if we don't do anything with the laws GDP by 30% uh, by, the, by the, the end of the century. But if we take active climate action, it will cost us only 0.1% of GDP. GDP. Now, you, you might have the sort of the suspicion that, oh, 0.1% of GDP is so small, is that true? And of course, in that, in that study here, it takes into account the coal benefit of climate change action. So what is coal benefit? Because if we do away with coal, if we would do away with oil altogether, then the air will be clean, right? We have no health problem whatsoever. If we do away with dirty energy, we have secured our energy in the future because coal and fossil fuel and oil has a limited reserve. But sooner or later, we will run out. We are running out of coal and oil. But if we do away with coal and oil, we use clean energy and so on, then we solve the, 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 the energy issue altogether. 
So uh, I'm going to do that. And uh, this is a health problem, health problem uh, published by a very authoritative general, uh, health general Lancet, Qi Zhang So uh, this tells us that uh, using nuclear is best in terms of the health consequences. They will use coal, oil, or coal, uh, lignite, which is the worst, fine, uh, worst kind of, uh, of coal, that it will create a lot of people dying, a lot of people sick. This is about death, this is about people sick. So uh, this is some kind of reference you can, you can take away and you consider what kind of uh, energy you should choose in the future. Um, go nuclear, well, this is, this is just, just, just one example. What, what I want to say is that if we really want to solve the problem right now, we don't have a single technology that can deal with it. We don't have a silver bullet. We have to use all, all methodologies available. All right? But I believe in the future, the ultimate solution lies with technology. So there are people who are working hard in those kind of technologies. For example, this TWL, traveling wave reactor. It's a nuclear reactor. It's a new one. A totally new concept, and that was actually funded by Bill Gates, and uh, they have all the groundwork done, and all is needed is to try uh, uh, build to, to, to build a prototype, right? As a matter of fact, Bill Gates has signed a sort of agreement or memorandum of understanding with China. So China was supposed to build a prototype of this kind of, of reactor, which is much more efficient, much safer than conventional nuclear reactors, and so on. Now, because of the trade war, that has to be scrapped. Right? You cannot transfer this kind of technology from the US to China because of the trade war. So this is sad. And then another thing, which is uh, ITER, is actually a fusion reactor. This is the ultimate solution. If we can succeed in that, we have infinite supply of fuel. This is deuterium or isotope of hydrogen, which is available from water. We have a lot of water in the ocean, all right? So there is no problem about, about the fuel. All we need to take is that we have to heat it up to 155 million degrees Celsius. So that is a big, big, big technological challenge. But the good news is that in China, in collaboration with Japan and a few other countries, they have succeeded in reaching 100 million degrees Celsius. So it is hopeful. It is hopeful, I don't know how long, maybe 10, 20 years from now, this kind of technology will be available then, everything will be solved. But don't count on that, because if we rely on the technology that is not yet available, we are reckless. Remember one of the slides that I, think, that I showed you before, right? Because that kind of nuclear fusion technology has been studied and uh, uh, tried to improve for about half a century. And well, I, I still remember that when I was when I first joined the Hong Kong Observatory, I was sent to UK for training, and then I had the chance to visit one of the research center about nuclear fusion in Europe. And the scientists told me that this technology should be available in 30 years time. And that time was 1983. So 30 years means 2012, uh, 2013. So uh, of, of course, the uh, sort of expectation or sort of estimation was wrong. Uh, we are still quite far away from this technology to be operational. But uh, we need uh, a development kind of future. So that's for Hong Kong, but uh, I'm not going to, because for time's sake. Uh, you can go to the uh, Council for Sustain Sustainability website. You have all the suggestions or all available options um, uh, to us here in Hong Kong. But Hong Kong is very peculiar peculiar in the sense that uh, we have very limited resources. Right? For, for the entire history of Hong Kong, we have to rely on outside. Food, water, whatever you name it, energy and so on. So some people suggest that, oh, we should build uh, renewable energy, large-scale renew renewable, renewable energy so that we can be self-sufficient. That is not true. That is not practical. 
Uh, so we have to be pragmatic. So uh, unfortunately, the public education, uh, public engagement process is concluded. But I hope that you will all pay attention to what is coming out uh, from the uh, from the Council for Sustainable, Sustainable Development. And hopefully there will be some channels where you can voice your own opinion, because after all, this is your future. This is not just the future of Hong Kong, but the future of the whole world. Thank you very much. So we still have a few minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot. Personally, I don't mind if you could like you know, another 15 minutes and then uh, keep on discussion now. Uh, but I know that you have another lecture, so I have so, so maybe maybe we, we won't be able to keep you for so long. So um, so any questions? I expect that now. So maybe I start. <laughs> maybe I start. Um, uh, so one of two questions that uh, for Professor Lam. So um, the first thing is that um, so I want to ask about from the Hong Kong perspective. So um, so some uh, so we know that so you discussed. So we know that some some, some people uh, in Hong Kong or in the world so they are against so they know they're skeptical about climate change and they deny about climate change. Um, so whether it is the consequences, whether it is the impact. So uh, as for uh, for the case of Hong Kong, so the people who are skeptical or who are denying the climate change. So we discussed this in the lunch. So what, what are the main reasons for them to deny it or to, to, be, to be skeptical in, in, in the context of Hong Kong? So this is, my, this is my first question. And the second question is, uh, I, I think, uh, so there are some suggestions already here. So but in, what is in your opinion? So what would you recommend so for us, uh, for the Hong Kong people, so that we could like, deal with the climate change in, in the case of Hong Kong? Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, uh, I'm going to answer it very briefly because I don't have a lot, a lot of knowledge about the questions. Uh, first of all, Hong Kong denies of climate change. I don't think that it is serious at all. Uh, there, there are appeals um, because they publish their opinion in the newspaper and so on and so on, but they are a very small minority. So climate deniers is not significant at all in Hong Kong. As a matter of fact, there are some uh, polls um, um, uh, conducted in Hong Kong a few years ago. Uh, the uh, awareness of Hong Kong people about climate change is pretty high, actually. Something like 90%, so this is very good. And many people believe that climate change is happening, so this is a good sign. But the bad thing about Hong Kong people is that we. We are not interested in it. We don't seem to be concerned about climate change. Despite the fact that we are badly struck by typhoon and goods last year, and at that time, a lot of people talk about climate change, but uh, a year on, uh, after, after the event, we seem to have forgotten about that at all. So, um, um, in Hong Kong, it's not about uh, climate denial. Uh, but uh, in other parts of the world, it is particularly in the U.S., which is very strange because U.S. is supposed to be the most advanced technological country you know, in the whole world. But strangely, it is the U.S. who have the most climate demands. Uh, it's actually about politics. Unfortunately, this also applies in Hong Kong because um, in this sort of public engagement, um, the government of the, the, the council is seeking the views of the public about various approach that we should use. Of course, enhancing renewable energy is of course the right way to do. As a matter of fact, we are gaining some progress in this regard because I don't know whether you have heard about the FIT sort of program where if you live in a new territory, you have a plant of your own, you can set up a solar panel at the rooftop, and then during daytime, you are in school, or your father and parents are working, so you generate a lot of electricity, but you don't use the electricity, so you can sell it to the power company. So this is the concept of FIT. That response is per pretty good. I think we now have something like several thousand applications close to 10,000 applications, so the response is very good. 
And you can actually make money out of it because the power com company gives you a very generous sort of cost or, 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 or price for your jet, uh, electricity. You know, one unit, one kilowatt hour of electricity roughly costs you one dollar. But if you generate your electricity, you can gain maybe four or five dollars. So this is a very good business. You can think about it. So um, we are moving forward. But unfortunately, the RE, renewable energy potential in Hong Kong is very small. It's very small. There, there are academics who have studied all kinds of uh, estimates about the maximum amount of renewable we can achieve. It's something like 10, 15 percent. So this is far, far, far away from decarbonization. Because decarbonization, we don't want any carbon dioxide at all, right? So one of the pragmatic approach is to cooperate with nearby regions, which is of course not Japan, not Taiwan, not Philippines. Is Guangdong, there's a greater, greater Bay Area and so on, because the Guangdong area has resources. What are the resources? Land. And they also have more green energy and so forth and so on, all right? So they can build a lot of wind farms along the shore. We don't have a lot of, a lot of shoreline, and so on and so on. So this is what we call regional cooperation. And as a matter of fact, in, in many focus group meetings, which involve the professionals in Hong Kong, unanimously they agree that we should promote sort of cooperation across the border. But politically, again, this is politics, just like the US. It is difficult to gain the consensus of the Hong Kong people to do that kind of regional cooperation. So this is sad, because after all, life is not about all about politics. We have to be concerned about quality of life, whether we are living happily or not. If you worry about air, you worry about food, you worry about water, then there is no quality of life at all. So we have to be pragmatic. Um, but again, this is, uh, the problem is easy to identify, but it's difficult to solve. It's the change of mentality about uh, China, about a cooperation with China. Um, but I can tell you some of my experience. It's not all bad across the, across the border. For example, I have been a sort of advisor to the uh, nuclear power plant in Taipei and Mango for, for a couple of years. And I am impressed with the way they manage the nuclear power plant. So a lot of people were afraid of nuclear. But a lot of sensible people uh, sort of, um, well, know that. Well, whether we like it or not, the nuclear power plants will be there. But one, one benefit of nuclear power plant is that it's basically carbon free. So why don't we reap the benefits, all right, cooperate with China, things like that. So, so that is something probably uh, you would like to consider. And then the second question is about how we should proceed. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a change of our entire civilization. And for us, as an individual, it is a change of our behavior. But don't say, don't think that our contribution is not significant. Of course, the contribution of an individual is very, very small, but if we multiply that by 7.6 million people in Hong Kong, that will not be small. And one very important thing about individual contribution is that, of course, ideally, it would be very nice to have Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong SARG to have a very good policy to promote all kinds of clean energy and so on and so on. That is very good because if we have a good policy in place, it will be effective, right? But policy formulation and implementation, we're talking about years, right? Hopefully three years, maybe five years, then a policy will be implemented. And with this kind of political sort of atmosphere right now, 
it is very difficult to have a meaningful discussion between the legislative council. It's very difficult to do something for the great good of Hong Kong people. But individually, if we do something to reduce our own carbon footprint, that impact is immediate. Right? So, for example, if you forsake eating beef for a month, then you will reduce the carbon footprint. If, for example, you are planning for a trip in uh, Christmas to somewhere else, well, have a second thought. Should I do that? Should I go around Hong Kong? Because there are a lot of people in Hong Kong with very good scenery. And I, I know some of my, many of my friends who tour for the sake of tourism. It's not really some place that really, really want to go. It's just that, oh, I want, I want to get out of Hong Kong every now and then. But we have to think that over in the larger context, which is trying to change. So there are a lot of, a lot, lot of things as individuals we can do, our diet, our consumerism, our uh, sort of uh, eating habits, and so on and so on. So I, I'm sure there are a lot of information on this. So we're still watching it now. We have maybe one or two, two more minutes. Now if you want to ask, then yeah, this is the time. Any of them? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, so uh, as seen from the presentation, it was good to be observed that the government's action or like global government action is um, very slow and it may be it may uh, return to stage one once uh, the power is then changed, like Obama to Trump and then everything is changed. So do you think that like uh, for business cooperations or like big uh, international business uh, to is it possible for them to take the lead to um, to do such things and be better than the government? Yeah definitely definitely this is actually happening. Uh, happy to say that this is happening. Uh, for example, uh, in Hong Kong, you have um, uh, there is a what we call the Business Environment Council, which is actually an NGO uh, promoting uh, environmental protection and promoting protection of, of, of planet. They are the members of the largest largest corporation in Hong Kong, like HSBC, like CLP, like Hong Kong Electric. So they have a lot of uh, large corporations that can contribute significantly in terms of uh, the electric carbon footprint. Because there is really a lot of things they can do for company purchasing, right? And they have very strange guidelines and rules for the staff to purchase things that you, they can use on a daily basis. Uh, and then scrutinize the source, where the source comes from, is it hurting the environment, so on and so on. They can make a big impact. And also going back to the case of U.S., uh, although Donald Trump, uh, just like George W. Bush, is unlike Obama who wants to leave a legacy for the U.S. and also for the world, for the whole world, for a better climate, uh, they, they sort of propose policies that is counter, um, counter, uh, counter, well, counter productive in terms of climate action. But we don't need to worry that too much. Because there are other states in Hong Kong, notably uh, New York State, California, and a lot of other states in Hong Kong are doing a very good job. But of course, there are other states which are very, very poor and, 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 uh, and anti-climate. For example, Florida. The governor of Florida is one of the worst governments in the world as, as far as uh, climate change action is concerned. Uh, because Florida is close to the sea, you know, Miami, which is a very famous city, is suffering from all kinds of problems as a result of sea level rise. But the governor do not allow the, 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 the civil servant to talk about climate change at all. The word, the term, climate change is forbidden for the civil service. So that is ridiculous. So we have some poor states in the, in, in the U.S., but we have some very abundant aggressive states in the U.S. So uh, just like individuals, we can do our own to contribute to that big problem and cooperation, in the industrial large cooperation, can obviously do uh, much more. 
That's a very good question, by the way. Thank you. Anyone?